Well, uh, obviously uh, you want to have the very best plants possible. So that requires you get the very best stock possible, either cuttings uh, or, or uh, seeds, you have to do that. The second thing is I think you have to absolutely know what kind of mycorrhizal fungi those plants associate with. Now, not, you know, the only plants really that you don't have to worry about are things your kids don't like to eat, the cabbages and, you know, broccoli, that family. Uh, but all the other plants you put in your garden have an association with a mycorrhizal fungi. And we're able to buy mycorrhizal fungi now, not every one, but we are able to buy uh, enough of them to be able to inoculate and infect our own plants from the get-go. So if you live in a place like Alaska, for example, we start off a lot of our plants indoors. And so we roll our seeds in the appropriate mycorrhizal fungi, and from the very start, those plants are associating with that fungi, and that fungi is going out into the little teeny pores that the roots can't reach and getting all the food it needs. So the second thing I would do if I was planting in a backyard garden is I would make sure I had the appropriate mycorrhizal fungi uh, and uh, that I knew how to apply it. It's very easy. Uh, you basically roll the seeds in it, and if it's a plant, you just make sure that it touches the roots, you roll the roots in it. Uh, there's a liquid now that you can actually spray on, so that's really easy. The third thing I would do uh, is make sure that the natural conditions are right. You know, you know, if it's a seed that's supposed to have been frozen, I want to make sure that's all that can happen. I want to make sure that the soil temperature is temperature. If it's a cool crop, it goes in early. If it's a warm crop, I have to wait until the temperature is right, because I learned in the second book about all of the enzymatic reactions that occur inside plant cells, and they are temperature related. So for example, well, it's, it's hard to imagine, there are you know, uh, uh, a thousand different enzymes in every single cell in a plant, and 10,000 10, examples of each one. So if you don't get the right, and they speed up things based upon, oh my god, they're phenomenal. So, so you wanna make sure there's the right temperature, um, obviously you want to make sure that you've got water uh, and that the water is applied first so that the garden is wet before you put anything down on it. Uh, and uh, then I think you just want to get going. No rototilling. You don't need a rototill. If you want to break up soil at all, the least amount of disturbance is all that you should be doing. I take a dowel or a two by four and just run it down the side of this. You don't have to disturb the whole garden just to plant a few seeds, it's crazy. Uh, so that's about it, really easy. And if you live in a place like Alaska, you, oh, well, one thing I left off, you've gotta have the right mulch. There are no bare soils in nature. And so you wanna cover the soil with the appropriate kind of mulch. And you can get some mulches that support bacterial growth and some mulches that support fungal growth. And so they, you know, they support both, but dominant one over the other. Uh, and, and you want to make sure that you have the mulch down on the garden. There are no bare soils in nature. Right. Soil testing I would do in the fall. Uh, and I think it's very important for two reasons. One, you absolutely cannot know what your plants need unless you test the soil. Simple as that. And we all know that information is power. Let's be, you know, good farmers and good garden farmers do it. Absolutely they do it, but gardeners don't. I, very few gardeners ever test their soil, really. Get a good test. And pick a lab that you're going to be able to go back to, because you want to test it again in another couple, two or three years to see how your soil is trending. Are you doing the right things? So you get a good lab, you tell them you're organic, you want the test to be organic, and you want the recommendations to be organic. So if you have compacted soil that's clay, adding organic matter is the only way you're gonna get that clay to default, you know. And, and so you've gotta add organic matter, and the easiest way to add organic matter may be rototilling. It also may be adding compost teas. Uh, and compost itself uh, is, is extremely useful, uh, and the microbes in the compost will work its way down, but you've gotta have organic matter, absolutely. Uh, the, the first thing that goes in a compacted garden, in a, com a compacted soil, are the, are the fungi. They're very fragile. And so you need to replace those. So, so you know, you might want to aerate a yard and then throw down compost so that it goes down into those individual holes. Uh, lately, there's been a tremendous movement towards cover cropping. Uh, and in, in soils, uh, you know, such as you've described, they use, uh, you know, carrots, um, daikon. The soil around the St. Louis Arch, uh, my friend James uh, Satilo uh, is taking care of a revamping of the 
of the uh, planting around the arch, the whole area is being revamped, and the soil was unbelievably compact. And I don't know whether it's because people walked on it or whatnot. And he planted daikon radishes there. Boy, did he catch a rift of heck uh, from the people of St. Louis who could not understand what he was doing uh, until he showed them what the soil is like now. Unbelievable. So, yeah, there are lots of things you can do, and you should do it because you want to have soil that's good, good structure, and got a lot of organic matter in it. There's two kinds of clover. You know, you want to get the annual clover for cover crops. So that you, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can remember back in the day when I was uh, a, a chemical head, uh, and wow, boy, I remember the first little bit. Of, I, I, I've got we, my wife and I, have qu quite a large lawn, uh, and and uh, I can remember the first bit of clover coming into that lawn. It was weed free, absolutely weed free, and I, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you it's a couple of acres at least, and. Uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you why it was read for you, but I think you can guess. And, and boy, here comes my conversion, and all of a sudden there's a little clump of clover. And, and you know, it took a little while to get used to, but today, oh, I love the clover. Here's the thing about clover that people don't understand. It used to be in lawn seed. It used to be in lawn seed in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And then one day someone took a picture, you know, during a golf match, the U.S. Open, I think in the 19, early 1950s, first color television sets. So the fairway, beautifully green, no weeds. Boom, next thing you know, we got an industry that's trying to kill weeds, selling grass seed, uh, feeding each other, and bye-bye clover. But it used to be a demanded part of lawns. They fix nitrogen. Yeah. I mean, you know, my gosh. It's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. You want, and it stays greener longer, I have to say, in drought. You want it in your lawn. It's a beautiful plant. Really, we're not fertilizing. We're not fertilizing the plant. What we're doing when we organically garden, when we are soil food webbies, uh, we are feeding the microbes, and they're fertilizing the plant. So I always call it microbe food now. And, and since I've written this third book, I realize how important adding the mycorrhizal fungi, which are microbe food getters. They are unbelievable. I, I, the, uh, the, I wrote the first book, Mycorrhizal Fungi, little teeny, little teeny couple of paragraphs, because that's what people knew about them back then. This was 1996 when I wrote the first book. And there was, you know, people, people knew about mycorrhizal fungi, but they, they still really couldn't grow them. And then, all of a sudden, they realized how important they were, so I did a revision of the book. The revised edition of Teaming with Microbes is because I had to add a new chapter on mycorrhizal fungi. Flash forward to 2000, you know, 15, 16, and all of a sudden, people recognized so many things that they thought they knew about mycorrhizal fungi were wrong, and that they are so important that they are not ubiquitous like we used to think they were. We used to think they were everywhere. You don't need to, they were there. You don't need to put them in the ground. No, 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 no. And then we discovered that they don't like phosphorus fertilizers. Holy crow. You know, what does everybody put it down on the, oh my goodness gracious. And so they don't grow then. And so all the studies where they were using phosphorus fertilizer, it said that they didn't have any impact. Well, that's because it was the phosphorus, wasn't the mycorrhizal fungi. So they had to go back and restudy everything without phosphorus fertilizers. And so all of a sudden, the body of knowledge was, there were 10 to 15,000 scientific papers that I went through for this book. They were not there in 1996. So, so I add mycorrhizal fungi. The fact that they can go out and get so much of the, of the nutrients, these essential nutrients that we talked about, for the plant without you having to do anything just demonstrates how important they are to the home gardener and the farmer. You have got to understand mycorrhizal fungi or you are going to be left in the dust. What I tell people is if you go to a nursery and, and they don't have mycorrhizal fungi, go to a different nursery because that one's not up to date. Right. And as we said before, enzymatic activity inside the plant. Absolutely. And so if you've got a situation, uh, you know, where you've got very, very cool temperatures, you'd think, oh, there's no activity. Yeah, there is activity, but it's a different, different microbes than you might normally expect. So for example, in Anchorage, Alaska, where I live, during the winter months, we get snow cover usually. Uh, and I, uh, uh, nobody that reads my column or that I know ever picks up their leaves. We run them over with a mower and just leave them. 
And during that winter month, there is more microbial activity right there at the soil level, right underneath that snow than any other time of the year. You wouldn't think that, even though the temperature is so cold. But generally, the warmer the temperature, the higher the, the activity. And of course, as we know from composting, uh, you know, you've got different kinds of microbes all the time. So in some instances, it's fungi. Some instances, it's actinomycetes. It's, it's a, you know, it's a whole different world.